Okay, Bismillah. So today we are going to start with the hematology. Okay. So this is a combined class for FOP as well as stars, as you people know. So I try to combine both the illustrated as well as SOP book. And I try to take whatever is like good in which book, whatever portion should be added in which book. For hematology, it is pretty messed up chapter. If you want to go to any textbook, I would say you go through illustrated, but SOP, whatever portions were necessary, I have added that, okay? But a lot of things are missing in illustrated, so it's better you go through the PDF if you don't want to go to, through the SOP, okay? And guidelines, only two or three guidelines is needed to be studied from hematology that we'll do in the next class probably. And this chapter, hematology, about half of the chapter, if we divide the chapter into two parts, half of the chapter is about anemia, about iron deficiency, thalassemia, sideroblast, then we have uh, spero hereditary spherocytosis, G6PD, autoimmune hemolytic anemia, all are like half of the chapter is about anemia. Then second half only we have some of the bleeding disorders, which are very common question they ask, what are the bleeding disorders? Like a baby was born and she was not given vitamin K. So how the baby will present and also von Willebrand's disease and hemophilia. This is one part. Another part is the thrombocytopenia. Okay. And then we come to, this is completely one part. This is about hematology. So hematology half part is basically about anemia, thrombocytopenia and bleeding disorders basically uh, it's like only one third part. Now, along with hematology, we'll study one more system that's in the next class that is about oncology. Okay, so in most of the books, it will be hemato-oncology. And even when I studied, I studied them together. Because, you know, if you are studying hematology, you need to study leukemia. Leukemia is a pretty important topic. So if you are studying oncology, you should study all of it. Because by now, we have completed a lot of chapter. And the oncology chapter in Illustrated is very well written. If you're going to study, we'll be studying from there. Anyway, that's for the next class. So today we are going to study with hematology. So give me a minute. Okay. Okay. So what is when we are studying about hematology, we need to know what is hematopoiesis or known as hemopoiesis. I hope the screen is visible to everybody. Yes. Okay. And yes. uh, please be responsive in class. And if you have any doubt, you can ask me multiple times. Okay. So what is hematopoiesis? It is the process of formation of the blood cells from the hematopoietic stem cell. Now up to where does this hematopoiesis or hemopoiesis takes place, right? So normally we think it's from the bone marrow. But what about in fetal life? So in fetal life, that is before birth, up to a few weeks in fetal life, the hemopoiesis takes place in the yolk sac. So from the yolk sac, we get the RBC, WBC, as well as the platelets. From six to seventh week of life, we get it from liver, spleen, and some of the bones. Okay, I forgot to write here bones. And then after birth, we only, the hemopoiesis occurs only in the bone marrow of long bones. Okay, so this is about hemopoiesis. Now we'll see about this how the hematopoietic, how the blood cells are produced from the hematopoietic stem cell. So you don't need to buy hard this. And I know that all of you actually know this uh, entire chart. We have studied this in our pathology, also in the first year of physiology. But there are some things that you need to study. I'll be telling that, okay? Hematopoietic stem cell has two is divided into, again, two types myeloid progenitor cells and lymphoid progenitor cells. From the myeloid cell, you will get megakaryocytes, okay? Megakaryocyte, erythrocyte, progenitor cells. Means megakaryocyte mean you, means you get platelets and erythro, erythroid progenitor means you get erythrocyte or known as RBC, okay? Then we have from the granulocyte macrophage progenitor cell. From here, you will get all the WBC, neutrophil, monocyte, eosinophil, basophil, all the fills, okay? 
Then we have the lymphoid progenitor cells. From the lymphoid progenitor cells, what we'll get? We'll get B cell, T cell, and natural killer cell, okay? So we have myeloid lineage, that is myeloid pathway and lymphoid pathway. From the lymphoid pathway, it's easy to remember only three cells, B cells, T cells, and natural killer cell. And then from the myeloid, we have RBC and platelets. And also from the granulocyte pathway, we have all the WBC, neutrophil, eosinophil, basophil, and monocyte. Now, what, what, what is important here is that one of the questions that come is that what are the cells of the lymphoid progenitor, lymphoid lineage? So they will give you B cell, T cell, and they'll not give you B cell, T cell. If you get B and T cell, it's easier. They'll give you the option of all these cells along with the natural killer cell. Because this natural killer cell, easily we don't remember this. So natural killer cell is one of the part of, is a part of lymphoid progenitor, comes from the lymphoid progenitor cells, okay? Another thing is that there is another infection we studied in infection immunology chapter, parvovirus B19. Over there, I told you parvovirus B19 causes, what are the things that parvovirus B19 causes? Aplastic crisis. Do you guys remember? Okay. Yes, ma'am, it affects erythroid progenitor cells. Mm. Okay, so we have Dr. Sartaj here. Yeah, you are going to answer all the questions now. I am sure about that. So uh, we, uh, we have Dr. Sartaj here. I think I was talking to you guys about Dr. Sartaj. He uh, recently finished us. He's going to go for FOP. So it will be really nice, you know, if you guys have any doubts and all, you can communicate with us, with me, of course, and in the group, if you want to be a group and communicate with each other, then you can ask him, he can tell you better, okay? And he has joined us for FOP, okay? So what happens is that the, as Dr. Sartaj say, what happens here is that the parvovirus B19, it will inhibit the myeloid progenitor cell or known as the erythroid progenitor cell here. So when it is inhibiting the erythroid or myeloid progenitor cell, specifically, I'm sorry, specifically, it actually inhibits the erythroid progenitor cells. So what, what will that lead to? That will lead to decreased synthesis or completely it will inhibit. Therefore, there will be no RBC. Erythroid progenitor cells will be inhibited. And therefore, that will lead to aplastic crisis or known as red cell aplasia. We are going to study about that, okay? So this is one question, parvovirus B19. This is the reason I showed this picture, okay? Parvovirus B19, it will inhibit the erythroid progenitor cells. Now let us study. We have studied the pathway, hematopoietic pathway. Now we'll study what is the normal level of the cells in the body. First, we have, can anybody tell me what is the normal level of RBC? Four point five to five point five. Okay, lakhs per cubic millimeter of blood. In female, it is four to five per cubic millimeter of blood. So what happens? Why is uh, RBC more in case of male? Just a general question. So what happens in male, we have testosterone, right? Males have testosterone. So testosterone actually increases the production of erythropoietin. So there is more erythropoietin means more RBC. You guys know, right? Erythropoietin is a hormone or a substance that is uh, secreted by the kidney. And it helps in erythropoiesis. That is, it helps in the synthesis of RBC. Does everybody know that? If you don't know, just remember this. These are certain things uh, I haven't found in exam, but you will need to know. Okay. So what happens is that there are certain factors you need to produce RBC. Okay. So one is that you need the raw materials. You need the bone marrow to be intact. You need the raw materials. What, do, what are the raw materials? You need to produce hemoglobin. So to produce hemoglobin, you need globin. You need iron. You need a lot of things, right? Along with that, you need a substance known as erythropoietin. So this erythropoietin is actually secreted from the kidney. And when there is 
erythropoietin what is the function of erythropoietin erythropoietin will stimulate the erythropoiesis therefore it will stimulate the production of rbc when erythropoietin is low then it will lead to decreased production of rbc and that will lead to anemia so what do you think about chronic renal failure why there is uh, anemia in chronic renal failure tell me because there is there was no production of uh, erythropoietin then exactly so in case of chronic that is why it's very i just told the erythropoietin is produced by the kidney so when there is chronic renal failure the kidney does not work so there will be no erythropoietin and therefore there will be no production of rbc or the production of rbc will be reduced right and that's why patient with chronic renal failure they suffer from anemia okay this was just a side question so what is the normal level of hemoglobin this is for adults leave this portion platelets is 150 to 400 1.5 to 400 into 10 raised to 9 or you can remember 1.5 into 4 lakhs wbc 4 to 11000 neutrophil 2 to 7.5 this is important to remember neutrophil and lymphocyte you don't need to remember eosinophil basophil monocyte but you need to remember neutrophil and lymphocyte okay so rbc it is 4.5 to 5.5 platelets 4.5 to 5.5 lakhs per cubic millimeter of blood platelets it is 1.5 to 4 lakh then white blood cell is 4 to 11000 neutrophil 2 to 7.5 and lymphocyte 1.5 to 4.5 we'll study why i'm talking about neutrophil we'll study in the next class hopefully this topic will come okay now what happens is that we know we just studied that in embryonic life this rbc is produced wbc and everything is produced from yolk sac then in from the liver and spleen and some in the last trimester it is produced from some of the bones now basically we are going to talk about hemoglobin what are the types of hemoglobin that is present in adult life that is present in fetal life so most importantly let's talk about what happens in case of embryonic life in early embryonic life there are two types of hemoglobin hemoglobin gobar and hemoglobin portland now what happens in fetal life in fetal life we'll have hemoglobin f or known as fetal hemoglobin and postnatal life or known as adult life like us we'll have hemoglobin a hemoglobin a is also known as adult hemoglobin hemoglobin a2 and hemoglobin f so since it is fetal life so the amount of fetal hemoglobin will be very high in adult life the amount of adult hemoglobin will be high and amount of fetal hemoglobin will be low right that's the normal logic but how much time does it take for this transition that is when a baby is born the fetus suppose the baby before being born she will have all the fetal hemoglobin maximum amount of fetal hemoglobin and 2 to 3 percentage of adult say maximum amount of fetal hemoglobin as it is written here so how this this will completely transform after birth into this so for this transformation that is for the baby to have adult hemoglobin it takes about 5 to 6 months by 1 year of age the baby will have hemoglobin of which is similar to the adult hemoglobin okay so remember fetal hemoglobin is hemoglobin f the fetus will have hemoglobin f in adults we have adult hemoglobin and only very small quantity of fetal hemoglobin okay so don't you think that if there is in adults if there is increase amount of fetal hemoglobin there should be some pathology yes there will be some pathology can tell, somebody tell me what will be that pathology Please repeat the question. The cell anemia. Sorry. Yes, yes. Tell me. You are telling something. Please repeat the question. Okay. See, fetal the fetal hemoglobin. The type of hemoglobin in the fetus is hemoglobin F, right? The type of hemoglobin in adults is hemoglobin A, and only small amount of fetal hemoglobin is present in adult. 
when the fetal hemoglobin increases in adult is more than the adult hemoglobin in postnatal life there is a condition it leads to a condition it leads to a disease what is that thalassemia ma'am thalassemia thalassemia yeah, exactly thalassemia also sickle cell anemia okay so we are talking so much about this uh, fetal hemoglobin what is this function of the fetal hemoglobin fetal hemoglobin differs from the adult hemoglobin in that it is able to bind to oxygen with greater affinity than the adult form giving the developing fetus better access to oxygen from the mother's blood stream the transfer of oxygen is from the mother to the baby more tightly bound okay now i will draw a picture and show you guys excuse the drawing this is just for learning purpose so it's just a drawing okay so this is the hemoglobin i'll just try to draw it in this is the lungs okay and then uh, we have this is the tissue say any tissue in the body Say brain, say stomach, anything, okay, or the skin, and then we have this. I'm sorry, that's my cat. Okay, so fetal hemoglobin, all hemoglobin actually can bind with four molecules of oxygen, right? Are we aware of that? Yes. Okay. so hemoglobin actually how it acts is that it can bind to four molecules of oxygen so the green part is hemoglobin and the yellow part is oxygen so what happens is that when one oxygen molecule binds to the hemoglobin it will increase the affinity to to bind with another oxygen and another oxygen will increase the affinity of another and this oxygen will increase the affinity of another so total in total one hemoglobin molecule can bind with only four oxygen it's like friends you know girls how they go for shopping they buy something and then they tell their friends like hey hey you also buy this uh, this thing is nice then this friend is going to tell the other friend hey you also buy this so they they, they act like girlfriends okay so that's how it works one hemoglobin when hemoglobin binds with one oxygen molecule that's going to increase the affinity of hemoglobin to another oxygen and that will immediately bind it so this mechanism what is happening now when this happens this mainly happens in the lung so when this happens what is happening in the lung there is lots of oxygen right so hemoglobin goes there and binds with all this oxygen four molecules of oxygen and this hemoglobin is going to come here in the tissue and it is going to release the oxygen right hello am i audible are you guys understanding yes. or do i need to repeat yes understand okay. understanding so far thanks okay so what happens this hemoglobin will come to the tissue and it will release the mo oxygen molecules so the oxygen it's going to go to the tissues these oxygen will be moved to the tissues right well and good and what oxygen releases the oxygen releases carbon dioxide and while coming back from the tissue the hemoglobin will be carrying the carbon dioxide and it is going to bring it to the lungs for oxygenation and carbon dioxide enters into the lung and it is oxygenated and again from here oxygen is transported by hemoglobin so hemoglobin is like a transport system it carries oxygen from one point from the lungs and then it transfer to the tissue while coming back it's like a transport transport it's a waste of money if it comes back alone so it brings the carbon dioxide to the lungs for oxygenation is this method understood yes ma'am okay so this is hemoglobin in general whether it is fetal hemoglobin whether it is adult hemoglobin all hemoglobin has this function now how does it transfer what is the mechanism so it's not needed for our exam but you must know that due to difference in partial pressure of oxygen and carbon dioxide okay 
so what happens is that i think if i go there it will be too deep and it's going to mess up okay so how it transports we know the pressure difference right always the water or osmosis we studied so this is not osmosis how the diffusion of gas occurs is by change in the pressure change in the partial pressure of oxygen and carbon dioxide just remember this much that's not necessary okay so due to this transfer pressure changes in the in the lungs what happens there is increased pressure of oxygen so the oxygen e will easily move towards hemoglobin and therefore hemoglobin is going to transfer here but in the tissue there is increased partial pressure of carbon dioxide because more carbon dioxide is produced and therefore carbon dioxide will easily bind to the uh, hemoglobin so this is the function hemoglobin carries the oxygen from the lungs and then it removes it or it transport transports it to the tissues and while coming back it carries the oxygen to the lungs this is the function of hemoglobin whether adult hemoglobin whether it is fetal hemoglobin now there is a difference that i read here the what is the difference between adult hemoglobin and fetal hemoglobin so fetal hemoglobin actually has more affinity towards oxygen than adult hemoglobin yes the adult hemoglobin also works well but the fetal hemoglobin suppose it has a affinity of 10 adult hemoglobin but the fetal hemoglobin will have an affinity of say 50 so it has very strong affinity to oxygen what is meant by that when there is strong affinity of the hemoglobin to oxygen what is going to happen there will be uh, unloading of oxygen from hemoglobin in tissues mm -hmm. so that means when there is increased affinity this fetal hemoglobin has come to the lungs it has so strong affinity it is going to hold on to more and more it is going to hold on to the oxygen very tightly now this mechanism is needed in fetal life where giving the baby giving the fetal oxygen is an important part okay because the baby don't have its lungs it cannot get oxygen from anywhere so we need to ensure that the oxygen is well reached to the baby that is why like god has made the fetal hemoglobin which is which has more affinity to oxygen which is ensuring like 100% transport of oxygen to the baby is this clear that is what they have told that the fetal hemoglobin differs from most adult hemoglobin in that it is able to bind oxygen with greater affinity than the adult form is this understood yes ma'am yes okay so it's maghrib time i'll just uh, go and come back in 5 minutes okay okay okay, okay i'll just go back and come in 5 minutes okay so everybody is aware of the function of hemoglobin fetal hemoglobin how it works yes doctor so in the lungs the partial pressure of oxygen is high so hemoglobin f that is fetal hemoglobin readily binds to the oxygen and then it comes to the tissue in the tissue the partial pressure of oxygen is low carbon dioxide is high so fetal hemoglobin will unload the oxygen and it will take the carbon dioxide and go back okay this one more slide but i want you to read this later not now we will be confused if we read this okay so what happens is that now just tell me i told you that fetal hemoglobin has higher affinity towards oxygen and i also to ask you guys in which all conditions the fetal hemoglobin will be high that is after birth after birth we are supposed to have only adult hemoglobin and we are supposed to have very less amount of fetal hemoglobin but in certain conditions the fetal hemoglobin will be high right what are those conditions thalassemia fetal plastic anemia and thalassemia okay so what will happen in those diseases so you know thalassemia and sickle cell anemia they are what kind of disease hemolytic kind of disease right 
okay i think I, i'll explain this later it will be more clear then okay now let's come to another topic it is known as oxy hemoglobin dissociation curve so what happens here is that they are showing the saturation of oxygen at certain pressures that is when the oxygen saturation see here you don't need to understand this for the exam just listen to it okay just you must know that okay how did they draw this curve how did it come just to, just get a overall idea this is not needed to know about deeply about the curve so what happens is that they plot the oxygen saturation what is oxygen saturation means how much amount of hemoglobin is binding with the oxygen at what pressure so they are saying that when the partial pressure of oxygen is 10 10 10 percentage of oxygen saturation that is 10 percentage of oxygen hemoglobin is binding to oxygen then you can see when the partial pressure of oxygen is 50 so here when the partial pressure of oxygen is 50 mm of mercury that time about 80% of the hemoglobin in our body has bound to the oxygen when the partial pressure of oxygen is 70 that time about 90% of the hemoglobin in our body has been bound to oxygen so this curve is about they are showing at what pressure oxygen will be bind or binding to the hemoglobin in our body okay so that is not no, no need to study so deeply you understood this concept like completely this is okay yes okay now what happens here is that what they ask in exam usually this particular curve oxy hemoglobin dissociation curve why they are known as oxy hemoglobin dissociation curve what is why the dissociation because the hemoglobin is carrying it the hemoglobin is carrying the oxygen and then it is dissociating that it is it is leaving away that it is transferring right it is dissociating separating from the oxygen and giving it to the tissues so it is known as oxy hemoglobin dissociation curve so this curve is normally known as sigmoid shaped curve okay now there are some reasons why the curve will shift to the right and curve will shift to the left so this is a normal curve okay when the curve shifts to the right suppose this is a normal position shifts to the right right means the oxygen reduced affinity reduced affinity of the hemoglobin towards oxygen that means hemoglobin i told you that the hemoglobin this is for all hemoglobin okay not only fetal hemoglobin hemoglobin has high affinity for oxygen so hemoglobin will bind with the oxygen and then it will bring it to the tissues right so if the curve is moving to the right and that means the hemoglobin has now low affinity to oxygen where there is low affinity in the tissue because when when the hemoglobin comes to the tissue its job is to leave the oxygen therefore in the tissue tissue space the hemoglobin will have low affinity for oxygen so it will leave the oxygen in the tissue and then it has high affinity towards what in the uh, tissue space carbon dioxide carbon dioxide so then hemoglobin will bind with the carbon dioxide okay so when they are saying the curve is shifting to the right that means the hemoglobin is having now low affinity to oxygen this is physiological but there are some pathological conditions where the hemoglobin affinity towards oxygen is reduced what are these conditions when there is increase in temperature when there is increase in 2 3 phosphoglycerate it is a substance when there is increase in the ph all these things will shift the oxy hemoglobin dissociation curve to the right side that means the oxygen the hemoglobin affinity towards oxygen will be low and therefore more and more oxygen will be released in the tissue right yes yeah. okay at least anybody didn't understand tell me because this is very important you have to understand this shifting to the right side means the oxygen affinity hemoglobin has low affinity towards oxygen we know hemoglobin will have low affinity when it wants to release the oxygen in the tissue right 
okay now when the oxygen shifts to the left this means the oxygen hemoglobin now has higher affinity towards oxygen this happens in what space where does this happen in the lungs in the lungs the hemoglobin will have higher affinity to oxygen and therefore the hemoglobin will increasingly strongly bind with the oxygen and that time the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve will shift to the left side okay now this is physiological but some there are some pathological conditions or so non physiological conditions where the hemoglobin curve shifts to the left side they are when there is decrease in temperature decrease in hydrogen ion decrease in the 2,3 diphosphoglycerate now in general i'll tell you this is the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve now just tell me what what does it mean when it shifts to the right side decrease in affinity of hemoglobin to carry oxygen yes and therefore it is going to release oxygen right what happens mm -hmm. when it shifts to the left side increase the affinity to oxygen that means it is going to bind strongly okay good everybody is clear with this thing yes okay yes okay now see what happened this is a trick you need to remember the curve shifts to the right side that means decrease in affinity to oxygen this is what you guys were telling so more oxygen will be released in the tissue now what are the causes of shifting of the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve to the right side the causes the causes are anything that increases shifts the curve to the right for example increase in the ph means alkalosis increase in temperature hyperthermia increase in 2,3 diphosphoglycerate increase in carbon dioxide this all factors will increase the will shift the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve to the right side so right side means anything that increases going to right anything that decreases goes to the left okay so right side we know right is always positive right things go right in life means positive things are happening in your life that's what we say so anything that goes right in life means it increases that means they are saying when temperature increases that means where the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve will go to the right 2,3 diphosphoglycerate increase right increase hydrogen ion increase hydrogen ion means remember this when the hydrogen ion increases it will be acidosis so the ph will decrease you don't need to consider the ph you have to keep in mind the alkalos is or you have to keep in mind the hydrogen ion so increase hydrogen ion means hydrogen ion is increasing therefore ph is decreasing so ph is hydrogen ion increasing means it will shift to the right and also temperature increasing means it will shift to the right carbon dioxide increasing means it will shift to the right so when there is increased carbon dioxide what will happen the hemoglobin is going to release the oxygen and will bind with the carbon dioxide it has low affinity towards oxygen so it is increasing oxygen right so that is how the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve we have to remember what are the causes of shifting to the right side what are the causes of shifting to left side the causes are same you just have to remember increase or decrease anything that increases moves to the right side Anything that decreases moves to the left side. Is it clear? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay. Causes of shifting to the right increase pH, alkalosis, increase temperature, increase 2, 3 diphosphoglycerate, increase carbon dioxide. Curve shifts to the left. That means increase affinity of hemoglobin for oxygen. So more oxygen will be bound to the hemoglobin. This happens usually in the lung. Causes anything that decreases, shifts the curve to the left. What are the cause? Decreased pH, hypothermia means decreased temperature, hypocarbia means decreased carbon dioxide, decreased 2,3 diphosphoglycerate. Remember this? So anything that increases, they usually in the recalls you will see, they will give the question, which among the factors shifts the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve to the right then they, they will give you option 
increased temperature, decreased temperature, increased pH, decreased pH. So you have to remember whatever the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve will shift to the right when there is increase in any substance. It will shift to the left when there is decrease in any substance. Any substance means temperature, 2,3-diphosphoglycerate, pH and carbon dioxide. Is this clear? Yes. Okay. yes. I hope everybody has understood this. This is very, very important. And you guys remember when we were studying a case in uh, cardio, I think it was in cardio, um, clinical cases task, case number five or Seven. I don't remember exactly. I was telling you guys, this is a part of hematology, but we were supposed to study here. So this is, I think then now you guys will be able to relate to that when you guys revise. Okay. So we are done with oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve. Now we'll come to anemia. What is anemia? Qualitative or quantitative deficiency in oxygen or RB, sorry, in hemoglobin or RBC, okay? So sometimes this means that the RBC may be present qualitative or quantitative. Sometimes entire RBC may be low. When RBC is low, hemoglobin is low, that causes anemia. Sometimes RBC may be present, but they are not good enough. What do you mean by not good enough? The RBC has hemoglobin, but the hemoglobin is not good enough to carry oxygen. That is called qualitative defect. So a qualitative or quantitative defect in the hemoglobin or decrease in the hemoglobin is known as anemia. Now for adults, the hemoglobin level is very different. But in pediatric population, we have different hemoglobin level at different age and we have to buy heart this, okay? Normally you have to remember, uh, it has to be above 100 gram per liter. So, you know, in, I think in most practice, they usually say in milligram, but in case of this uh, hematology chapter, I have seen even in FOP as well as in the uh, this chap illustrator textbook, they have expressed it in grams. So, you have to say in grams. In the neonate, it is usually, if we'll call it anemia, if it is less than 130, what is the normal level then? Normal level in neonate is more than 140. See, fetal hemoglobin, concent hemoglobin concentration at birth is more than 140. Okay. okay. So, in neonates, it will be called anemia if the amount of hemoglobin is less than 130. In 1 to 12 months, if it is less than 100 gram per liter, we'll call it anemia. 1 to 12 years of age, if it is less than 110 gram per liter, we'll call it anemia. So usually it comes in the question, a neonate, this is a newborn baby born, the amount of hemoglobin in the baby is 130. So what is the amount of hemoglobin? And sometimes they'll ask you, this is the amount of hemoglobin, is any treatment required? So you see, if it is less than 130, only then you'll go for the treatment. If it's 130 or if it's 140, you don't need to go for treatment, okay? Now let's study anemia, hemoglobin below the normal range. That is again in the neonate, if it is less than 140 or known as 130. 1 to 12 months of age, that is in infancy, less than 100 gram. In 1 to 12 years of age, less than 110 gram per liter is known as anemia. Okay. Now we studied what is anemia. Now let us study what are the causes of anemia. Okay. In general, can uh, just tell me what are the causes of anemia? What do you think? Red cell destruction or increased production? Mm -hmm. Decreased production due to red cell destruction that it is being properly produced, but still there is any destruction. Okay. Now we'll, we'll see. Okay. There are many different causes of anemia. This table is very nicely written in uh, the illustrated textbook. So I just took it from there. So causes of anemia may be due to impaired red cell production. That is the red blood cells are not produced itself. Okay. So what could be the cause? Maybe due to red cell aplasia, due to parvovirus B19 infection, diamond black fan anemia, transient erythroblastopenia of childhood and other causes like leukemia, aplastic anemia, etc. And due to qualitative abnormal erythropoiesis, that is 
due to defect in the raw material basically this means due to iron deficiency folic acid or vitamin b12 deficiency chronic inflammation due to chronic renal failure so these are the these are basically the raw material defect so they are saying that rbc is produced from the bone marrow right this is the rbc progenitor cell from here this is this rbc will be produced so when there is defect in the cell production that is in the factory like in the bone marrow when there is defect what is the defect due to red cell aplasia all these reason parvovirus b19 parvo uh, diamond black fen anemia transient erythroblastopenia of childhood and when everything is okay but still there are no raw materials we need iron we need folic acid we need vitamin b12 we need all these things for the production of rbc we need erythropoietin so erythropoietin comes from the kidney when there is renal failure there will be no erythropoietin when there is iron deficiency when there is folic acid deficiency so no production of rbc and that will lead to anemia so this is about impaired red cell production this is one cause we'll study some of the some of this cause in detail now another one cause is increased red cell dip, dis, uh, destruction or known as hemolysis that means red blood cells are produced properly they are well and good but still they are after production they are destructed so when they are destructed it leads to what again that will lead to anemia because that will lead to decrease in the rbc right so what are the causes of destruction of rbc or what are the causes of hemolytic anemia they are due hereditary spherocytosis g6pd glucose 6 phosphate dehydrogenase deficiency thalassemia sickle cell anemia and immunological causes now how are this divided first is if there is any red blood cell membrane disorders you know in hereditary spherocytosis we'll study in detail there is a protein known as pectrin so in this rbc membrane there is some defect in the membrane because of this the rbc becomes very much fragile and it will be easily breaking when it passes through the blood vessels this condition again leads to breakage of the rbc so this leads to anemia this condition is known as hereditary spherocytosis where there is defect in the membrane then red cell enzyme disorder there is an enzyme in the rbc known as g6pd so when this g6pd enzyme is absent this also leads to hemolysis that is known as g6pd deficiency hemoglobinopathies hemoglobinopathies means there is some structural defect either qualitative or quantitative defect again what is qualitative and quantitative qualitative means the hemoglobin is produced but it's 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 there in good amount but it's not well enough it's not efficient enough there is some defect in it and quantitative means enough hemoglobin is not produced so these are hemoglobinopathies means there is some defect in the hemoglobin not in the rbc so that is caused that is called thalassemia and sickle cell anemia now another cause of hemolysis or hemolytic anemia is immunological disorder such as hemolytic disease of the newborn or to immune hemolytic anemia you guys know about hemolytic disease of the newborn how it is caused rh incompatibility yes due to rh incompatibility we'll study about that in detail okay so these are the causes of anemia okay it could be due to decrease red cell production it could be due to increase red cell destruction another one could be due to blood loss okay now when there is blood loss that is in case of fetal maternal bleeding during delivery due to chronic gastrointestinal blood loss in case of meckel's diverticulum or in case of any kind of hemorrhoids or if the child is having uh, inflammatory bowel disease like we studied ulcerative colitis ulcerative colitis there will be bloody diarrhea that will also lead to anemia then we have inherited bleeding disorders such as von willebrand's disease this will also lead to anemia right is this clear yes yes okay. now we are going to study about some pathophysiology okay it's a very interesting topic just keep your mind open i know all of you know the answer so first one is that this is about hemolytic anemia so this is the rbc okay 
the rbc is nice it is produced from the membrane it is produced from the bone marrow it is coming into the circulation after coming to the circulation there may be there is some defect in the rbc that is it may be g6 pd deficiency it may be a membrane defect that is hereditary spherocytosis thalassemia sickle cell anemia due to this defect what will happen the rbc is broken down okay the rbc is broken down say this is i'm taking the example of hereditary spherocytosis okay i told you hereditary spherocytosis there is a defect in the membrane of the rbc so when the defect in the membrane of the rbc it becomes normally what is the shape of the rbc is like this like a peanut yes, biconcave shape and you know it is so much flexible because it is biconcave shape it can easily pass through the blood vessels so in hereditary spherocytosis there is a protein deficient okay due to some mutation a protein that stabilizes this rbc membrane is lost okay so that will make this this usually it is supposed to become this this shape but the rbc membrane will become so fragile and it is going to break it will not be stabilized and it is going to become spherical shape spherical means like a marble like a ball okay now it is like spherical stiff shape now when it passes through the uh, blood vessels it will easily break because this biconcave shape is actually very flexible it can easily pass through the blood vessels but when there is hereditary spherocytosis what happens here here it becomes spherical uh, spherical shape that is why it is known as spherocytosis that is spherical spherocytosis it becomes spherical shape now it cannot pass through the blood vessels or even if it passes it breaks down that's why it leads to hemolytic anemia so when this rbc will break down there will be no rbc or there will be reduced rbc in the blood that will lead to hemolytic anemia is this clear yes okay now this rbc is produced from the bone marrow right now what happens when there is low rbc in the blood we studied you guys remember when we studied adrenal insufficiency we studied about a feedback mechanism in the body so when there is low rbc in the blood the body will immediately send signals to the bone marrow they will be like we are really we are breaking out okay we are just being destroyed all the time there is a lot of hemolysis there is some war going on here you need to start making more and more cells so what will happen the bone marrow will start making more and more cells it will be like okay i am in an emergency i need to make more and more cells okay so when it makes more and more cell because it is making in such short period of time in an emergency the cells will come as immature rbcs okay because you we know that rbc you know this is not important for the exam just remember rbc growth it has in the bone marrow it passes through some stage mature rbc mature rbc so many things and finally it becomes mature rbc mature rbc has no nucleus and this immature rbc has nucleus so the when the bone marrow is stimulated because there is a lot of hemolysis going in the body the bone marrow is like okay i need to activate and i need to produce some uh, rbcs in emergency it's an emergency condition so it leads to production of lot and lots more of rbcs but it is producing rbc but the rbc is not mature enough so it leads this this immature rbc is known as reticulocyte that is why in hemolytic anemia there will be increase in the reticulocyte count in the body is this understood yes ma'am okay uh, please i want uh, everybody to respond because i'm not sure if you guys are understanding or not okay so this bone marrow is producing rbc so what are the materials that i told you it needs to produce rbc it needs iron iron right? folic acid vitamin c 
uh, it needs iron it needs folic acid it needs vitamin b12 then it needs erythropoietin okay so there is iron suppose what is happening is that there is some destruction going or in or you can say that hmm, there is some destruction going in the body this rbc is being destroyed so bone marrow wants to produce more and more rbc okay so it is producing rbc but the rbcs are immature when there is iron deficiency what happens is that the rbc is the main material iron is the main important very important material for the hemoglobin production so what will happen the rbc will be very small in size because it is producing the bone marrow okay it's an emergency situation the bone marrow is producing rbc but, but there is iron deficiency so it will lead to formation of small 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 rbc moreover they are immature immature rbcs means reticulocyte okay and second thing is when there is defect in the when there is deficiency of vitamin b12 and folic acid so what is the function of vitamin b12 and folic acid in the synthesis of rbc okay so vitamin b12 and folic acid helps in dna synthesis and maturation of the rbc so when there is suppose there is this hemolysis going on and the bone marrow is producing rbc all materials are present so it will produce rbc but immature rbc reticulocyte will be high but in spite of that suppose there is folic acid deficiency and vitamin b12 deficiency so therefore it is producing immature rbc on top of that due to folic acid and vitamin b12 deficiency this dna will not be synthesized in the rbc and there will be no maturation of the dna of rbc so that will lead to very much immature rbc plus increase reticulosa increase size of the rbc immature rbc plus increase size of the rbc that is known as megaloblastic anemia is this understood these are known as megaloblast megaloblastic anemia how does it happen when there is deficiency of folic acid and vitamin b12 so the bone marrow will produce some rbc which will not be mature enough and the dna is not synthesized well dna is not mature enough so they try to synthesize big big rbc and they are known as megaloblast so you know even this big rbcs are not well enough if the dna is not mature so the rbc cannot function normally right this is about folic acid deficiency and bone marrow uh, vitamin b12 deficiency and did you guys get about the reticulocyte how the reticulocyte uh, count is high how the reticulocyte is produced in case of uh, hemolytic anemia yes yes we can yes yes okay yes. now what happens is that so we are seeing this is the bone uh, hemolytic anemia this is the bone marrow from the bone marrow rbc is produced okay this is a good rbc it is produced but this rbc is then destroyed destroyed due to glu uh, glucose 6 phosphate dehydrogenase deficiency due to hereditary spherocytosis whatever it is this rbc is destroyed when rbc is destroyed this will send a signal to the bone marrow and bone marrow will produce more and more rbc but there will be a lot of reticulocyte immature rbcs as well apart from the normal rbc now now tell me what will happen this when this rbc is breaking down normally what is the life span of rbc 120 120 days. 120 days so when this rbc is breaking down before 120 days what is happening the rbc consist of hem and globin right yes hem hem and globin so globin is actually what is globin proteins yeah it is a plasma acid. protein it is a plasma protein so protein is basically amino acid and hem what is hem hem consist of iron so then hem this hem will be converted into biliver bilirubin bilirubin and biliverdin and biliverdin okay and this bilirubin biliverdin will go to the liver and then there it will be conjugated that's a different story we have studied that in our hepatology 
Now, when there is increase in the RBC breakdown, what will happen to the amount of bilirubin? Increase the amount of bilirubin. Yeah, because more and more RBC is breaking down. So, more and more bilirubin will be there in the body. And it is so much bilirubin that the body is not able to excrete it. So, that will lead to jaundice. So, we have anemia because of destruction of the RBC. Then we have jaundice due to increased bilirubin. And this bilirubin is mainly unconjugated because it is so much the body is not able to conjugate it. Means excrete it. Make it, convert it into excretable form. Okay. Now, what happened? This all the broken RBC normally after 120 days, they are taken to the spleen. All the broken RBC, it's like a hospital, they're taken to the spleen. Okay. But now the RBC, instead of 120 days, they are breaking down in about 7 to 10 days. Within 7 to 10 days, they're breaking down because of hemolysis. So this is the spleen. The spleen will be so much jammed. The spleen will be hyper-functioning. It has some function normally after 120 days. Okay. Suppose you get a job. After every 120 days, you have to do this work. You are getting one pile of work. But now instead of 120 days, after every 7 to 10 days, you're getting a lots of work. So obviously, you will be hyper-functioning. You will be burnt out. So this is what happens to the spleen. The spleen is hyper-function. Yes, you are right. That leads to splenomegaly. It leads to hyper-function. It gets activated. There will be hyper-activation, activation of the spleen. So that leads to splenomegaly. So you guys understood how the splenomegaly happens in hemolytic anemia, how there is increased bilirubin and increased RBC. So how, how the things are happening? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Yes. yes. I hope it's clear to everybody. Yes. Yes. Okay, thank you. Okay. Now this was about, we studied about the causes of anemia, right? that it could be due to increased destruction, maybe due to increased blood loss. Okay. So what happens in blood loss? How does it work in blood loss? Can somebody tell me? It's easy. Same mechanism. When there is blood loss, there will be again decreased RBC. So the RBC, decreased RBC will send a signal to the bone marrow that we are reduced, send more blood. So it will, there will be increased production. Immature, immature RBC production. Yeah, sometimes it will lead to immature. Sometimes it can lead to if it is if it is not able to body is not able to compensate. It's very much severe condition. Then it will lead to immature, because it's just blood loss. All the raw materials are present. But if it is like within compensation, okay, all raw materials are present. It's not that severe. Then the body will be able to compensate and it will produce normal RBCs. Okay. Now this is about the causes of anemia. Okay. This chapter I told you, if you divide two parts into hematology, it's half chapter is about an anemia. If you understand anemia well, you, you can feel like, okay, half chapter is done. Okay. Then now we'll study the pathological, sorry, the morphological classification of anemia. We studied the cause of anemia. Now we'll study the uh, morphological classification of anemia. Okay. There is another classification of anemia. Clinical classification, mild, moderate, severe class anemia that we usually see in uh, the practice, right? That's not needed for our exam for now. So morphological classification, we have microcytic anemia. Microcytic anemia is seen in case of iron deficiency, thalassemia, sideroblastic anemia, and anemia of chronic disease. That is in case of iron deficiency anemia, in case of thalassemia, in all these cases, it will lead to microcytic anemia. That is the RBC will be very small. It is usually microcytic hypochromic. Hypochromic means less color, pale color. Then we have normocytic normochromic anemia. Normocytic normochromic anemia is seen in case of anemia of chronic disease. Okay. And in case of hypothyroidism and in case of renal disease, no need to remember the iron deficiency. It will confuse you. They're saying early. So anemia of chronic disease, of course, if it is chronic renal failure, there will be decrease in the um, erythropoietin. And when there is decrease in the erythropoietin, there will be decreased production of RBC. But whatever RBC is produced, they will be normal, right? 
because it is normocytic normochromic anemia it is giving the raw materials it is not like iron iron is responsible for the size and shape but in the erythropoietin for example i'm just taking the example of erythropoietin say in case of uh, that's why in case of chronic renal failure mostly they lead to normocytic normochromic anemia only in some cases it will lead to microcytic anemia how because suppose there is chronic blood loss or chronic renal failure or there is marrow failure the marrow is become like very poor in production of the rbc but all materials are present so it will lead to production of rbc it will be low less amount of rbc instead of suppose 4.5 to 5.5 lakhs it will produce suppose 1 lakh but they will be normal they will be normal looking rbc they will be functioning rbc but not enough these are known as normocytic normochromic anemia means the cells the rbc are normal size and shape and color is normal this is known as normocytic normochromic anemia now macrocytic anemia macrocytic anemia means the size of the rbc is large now what did i tell you in which all cases will get macrocytic anemia megaloblastic anemia hmm in which case folic acid deficiency or vitamin b12 deficiency in this cases what happens is that it leads to maturation folic acid and vitamin b12 helps in maturation of the dna of rbc and leads to maturation of rbc so when there is folic acid and when there is vitamin b12 deficiency see study only the points that i marked okay so that will lead to formation of huge rbcs which are very much immature they are not dna is not synthesized well enough they are not mature enough so that leads to macrocytic anemia yeah when we look into the slide when we see the blood film we'll see large large rbc huge rbc macrocytic rbc okay so this is about the morphological classification is this okay with everybody understood yes okay now let us go yes. to the okay now we'll study iron deficiency anemia what kind of uh, anemia is this microcytic okay microcytic and what could be the cause of iron deficiency anemia in causes what did we study <coughs> nutritional yes nutritional cause yes so iron deficiency anemia what is the site of absorption of iron duodenum duodenum so duodenum okay in the sop book it is written duodenum in our clinical cases book it is written jejunum so i have put both the options okay because we don't know what they are preferring both these books are uh, recommended by the rcpch so you will keep in mind duodenum as well as jejunum okay now what are the causes of iron deficiency yes yes please but there was a question in the recent paper that in which form it is absorbed either it is in ferrous form or ferric form it was mentioned in the question that it is absorbed in duodenum but they were asking about the form in which form it is absorbed ferrous form or ferric form storage form is peritene peris ferrous so it will be ferrous no, no. form it will be absorbed yes ma'am it is it will be stored in the form of ferritin so iron is stored in the body absorbed in ferrous and stored in the form of ferritin okay in the task okay. exam this question came yes ma'am uh, this time the task uh, this all about very much basics we have to give more uh, we have to emphasize more on the small small things because all these years they were they were only asking about this uh, iron absorption and stuff what is the site of absorption okay anyway so iron deficiency anemia what could be the causes maybe due to reduced iron intake dietary intake is low malabsorption or maybe due to blood loss malabsorption means the iron is absorbed in the duodenum so this is the stomach and this is the duodenum okay and when there is any malabsorption syndrome when there is any malabsorption at this portion that is duodenum so iron will not be absorbed and that will lead to iron deficiency anemia which disease uh, this there is decrease iron absorption from this part 
We studied in GIT. Celiac disease. Yes, very good. So in celiac disease is a pathology. Celiac disease is the type four hypersensitivity. So it is an autoimmune disease. There is some pathology in the duodenum or jejunum. So that leads to decreased functioning of this. There will be no functioning of this area. It will fail to reabsorb anything, absorb any nutrient. So this portion we know, duodenum or jejunum is responsible for iron absorption. So if you have by malabsorption, they mean celiac disease. So if you have celiac disease, you will have iron deficiency anemia, right? So patients with celiac disease, they will also have iron deficiency anemia. Yes. Next is, how are the clinical features? How they'll present? So iron deficiency anemia, if the iron, even when the hemoglobin is less than up to 20, that time also the patients can be like very much asymptomatic. They may be completely asymptomatic. They may not present with any features of anemia. They may be accidentally diagnosed, okay? Or sometimes they'll usually present with child feels tired easily. So they are small babies, right? They cannot tell you that I am tired. So what are the features that you need to keep in mind? They will feed very slowly. They will not be interested in having food. Then there is tachycardia, pallor, pallor of the skin, conjunctiva, that is eyes and the tongue. The tongue becomes pale and the papilla will be projected. And there is pica. What is pica? I'm eating, eating uh, uh, non nutritious uh, foods like the clay. Mud, clay, whatever they want, they'll have it. So there is another uh, toxicological, um, yeah, another substance toxicolo in toxicology that causes pica. What is it? Not Dr. Sartaj, you know the answer. Lead poisoning? Lead, yes, lead poisoning. Lead poisoning leads to pica. So usually lead poisoning will show, show all the features of iron deficiency anemia. There will be pica, there will be iron deficiency anemia. Along with that, there will be abdominal pain, hematemesis. That's it. So remember this, okay? Pica is also seen in lead poisoning. So these are the features of iron deficiency anemia. Now, how will you diagnose? You will see the full blood count. Then you will find the hemoglobin. The RBC is low. You might find RBC is normal also. The hemoglobin will be low. Serum iron profile. Now we'll study about the serum iron profile in a table nicely, okay? In serum iron profile, what you will see? Serum ferritin will be very yeah, low. Yes, serum ferritin will be very low. Yeah. So, yes. And then what is in the blood film? You'll find microcytic hypochromic cells, RBC. Okay. So this is about the investigation. Now treatment. How will you treat the baby? So what happened is that you'll increase the dietary intake and you will give an advice about taking oral iron supplementation. And if oral iron supplementation, you have to, if you're giving it, you have to continue until the hemoglobin level is normal. Suppose the baby's hemoglobin level is supposed to be 100 in infancy. It is up to one year of age, but it is 90 or say 95. So you have to continue the iron iron supplements until the hemoglobin level is normal up to 100. After that, when it reaches 100, after that, plus three months, you have to continue. This It has reached 100, still you have to continue for three months. Why? For the increase in storage. Yes. To increase the storage of iron, you're giving extra three months so that the iron is well stored in the body to function later. Okay. If does not respond to therapy, then investigate for blood loss or malabsorption. If you are suspecting that if you have got this iron deficiency anemia patient, you, you saw the blood film, you saw the iron profile and you have given iron supplements, still the baby is not responding. Hemoglobin is not increasing. So you have to suspect, okay, maybe it is a malabsorption syndrome or maybe there is some chronic blood loss going on, okay? And usually in iron deficiency anemia in the pediatric population, as they mentioned in the book, is that we don't go for blood transfusion until the hemoglobin is 20. So when the hemoglobin is supposed to be 100 in infancy, if it is even less than 20, then they will think of the blood transfusion. More than 20, they don't usually think of blood transfusion, okay? That is what is written in the textbook, okay? Not in practice. So this is about iron deficiency anemia. Okay. Now the next point we'll study. 
See here. Sorry. See, red cell decrease red cell production due to iron deficiency anemia, folic acid deficiency also I told you, folic acid deficiency due to immature RBC will be there. Now red cell aplasia. Red cell aplasia means this is the bone marrow. From the bone marrow, the RBC is produced. When there is red cell aplasia, the bone marrow itself will not be able to produce any RBC. This all factors, what are the things? Parvovirus B19 infection, diamond black fan anemia, transient erythroblastopenia of childhood. All these diseases will lead to inhibition of the erythrocyte progenitor cell. And therefore, there will be no production of RBC. Isolated, it could be isolated red cell aplasia. Other, other blood products such as WBC, platelets, they will be produced in normal amount. But there will be red cell aplasia. So we'll study what are the causes of red cell aplasia. Red cell aplasia causes anemia due to reduced or absent red cell precursor in the bone marrow. Three main causes in childhood are diamond black fin anemia, transient erythroblastopenia of childhood and parvovirus induced aplastic crisis. Okay. Now first we'll study about diamond black fin syndrome. What is diamond black fin syndrome? It is an autosomal dominant disorder. So almost in all conditions, I try to put the autosomal dominant and autosomal recessive. This, uh, you know, I try to include what kind of genetic disorder is it. Because we are dealing with pediatric medicine. Pediatric medicine has a lot of almost most of the like 80 to 90 percent of the causes will have some genetic predisposition or some new mutation. So sometimes this will not be mentioned in when we study in genetics. That's why I try to mention everywhere. If you cannot remember, just listen. You know, you'll have an idea. We cannot buy heart it right there and then. So autosomal dominant disorder that leads to red cell aplasia. It presents around two to three months associated with other congenital anomaly such as cleft palate, cleft lip. There will be thumb abnormality and there will be growth restriction. Okay, so diamond black fin syndrome, there will be red cell aplasia, that means reduced red cell. When there is reduced red cell, what will happen? When RBC is reduced, how the child will present? With sharpness of breath, pain. Ah, with anemia, in short, with anemia. So red cell aplasia means the child will present with anemia. We're studying about anemia, right? Everything relates to anemia. So that will lead to anemia, okay? And along with anemia, the child will have some other congenital anomalies and usually presents around two to three months. So how will you do the laboratory test? How will you exclude that it is not any other cause? First one is there will be macrocytic anemia. Okay. Due to this, there will be macrocytic anemia. The mechanism is not known. Just remember this. There will be low reticulocyte count, normal white cell count, normal or increased platelet, increased fetal hemoglobin. So you see why low reticulocyte count? Because it leads to red cell aplasia. That means all the red cells, if it is mature RBC, immature RBC, the entire red cell pathway will be suppressed. That's why it leads to low reticulocyte count. Okay. And just remember only this much. This is usually they ask that a child has come to you and with uh, red cell aplasia, features of red cell aplasia, other blood cells are normal and associated with other congenital anomaly. He has absence of thumb. Thumb is absent. Thumb abnormality. What is the, what is the uh, treatment? Or what is the diagnosis? They usually ask. Okay. You have to give symptomatic treatment in this. Now, next cause of red cell aplasia is transient erythroblastopenia of childhood. This transient erythroblastopenia, see the name itself is saying it is transient, means it is only for some time. For some time. Yes. So it presents around two years of age. It is not associated with any anomaly, but due to some unknown infective agent, it will resolve by four to eight weeks of age. So no need any kind of treatment. This is called transient erythroblastopenia of childhood. Usually it will present after any kind of infective disease, any kind of illness. So you need to keep the patient on follow-up, okay? 
that maybe it's just a transient erythroblastopenia by two years of age, or, it, or it, is it actually any kind of anemia? You need to keep the child on follow up. Next one, another cause of red cell aplasia is parvovirus B19 induced aplastic crisis. That is here, parvovirus B19 will inhibit the erythrocyte progenitor cells and that will lead to red cell aplasia. That means no red cell production from the bone marrow that leads to anemia. Okay. Now, there is a difference between, what is the difference between the diamond black fin and transient erythroblastopenia? Can you guys tell? We just read. Age difference. Yeah. One is, this, yes. This uh, diamond black fin will present two to three months. Transient erythroblastic will present at two years. Two months, two years. This one will have some family history because it is autosomal dominant, right? And there will be some congenital abnormalities present. And this one will not have any kind of congenital abnormality. And diamond black fin syndrome, it will present with aplastic anemia for a long time. So you need to treat the patient. Transient erythroblastopenia, it's transient only. It will resolve by four to eight weeks. So you just no need treatment. You just need to keep the patient on follow-up. So that is what they're saying here. Physical abnormality, that is congenital abnormality will be present. 50% cases present. Just remember present. Here it is absent. Family history is present. Why? Because it is autosomal dominant disorder. Here family history is absent. MCV will be high because it causes macrocytic. This is not needed. Come here. Spontaneous recovery. So recovery is occasional. They do not always spontaneously recover. It is a congenital condition. It is a genetic defect. But in case of transient erythroblastopenia of childhood, it always spontaneously resolves. Okay. Are we clear till here? Yes, ma'am. So we studied yeah. about red cell aplasia, causes of red cell aplasia. Then we studied about anemia, the design deficiency anemia. Okay. Now let us study about hemolytic anemia. So what are the causes of hemolytic anemia? So hemolytic anemia may be caused due to metabolic abnormality. Like in case of this, for the hemoglobin to work, there is an enzyme known as G6PD. This G6PD enzyme, it protects the RBC from oxidative damage. When this G6PD enzyme is absent, there will be oxidation of the RBC and it will lead to damage of the RBC. And RBC will break easily. Okay. Another abnormality that can lead to hemolytic anemia is hemoglobin abnormality. That is sickle cell disease. Here the RBC is sickle cell shape. Then thalassemia, impaired production of alpha or beta chain of the hemoglobin. This can also lead to hemoglobinopathy or hemolytic anemia. Okay. Second, next one is membrane defect, hereditary spherocytosis. As I said here, hereditary spherocytosis is an autosomal dominant disorder. There will be a defect in the membrane known as, there is a protein known as spectrin. When this protein is present, the membrane will not be stable. So when the RBC matures, instead of becoming a biconcave shape, it becomes spherical shape, which when passes through the blood vessels, it will easily break down. That will lead to hemolytic anemia. What about sickle cell anemia? What is the pathophysiology? Hemoglobin polymerization. Yes. And what happens is that it is again hemoglobin sickle cell disease. What happens? There is some, it is an autosomal recessive disease. And there is some point mutation. There is some genetic defect. Due to this genetic defect, we'll study what defect is it. The RBC, instead of becoming biconcave shape, they become sickle shape. This is a sickle shape. Okay? They become sickle shape. Okay. Now, the sickle shape hemoglobin does not have much ability, first of all, to carry oxygen. There is very less space. Second thing is that it will easily break. If it is not the standard shape and size, it will easily break when it passes through the blood vessels. What about thalassemia? What is the problem here? In thalassemia, yes, tell me. 
hemoglobin chain production defect yes you are right so the hemoglobin is produced by two alpha and two beta chain okay suppose these are two alpha chain and two beta chain this together produces a hemoglobin molecule on molecular level when there is absence or defect of this chains beta globin chain alpha chain or beta chain that leads to thalassemia so that means when there is defect in this chains that means they are producing a defective hemoglobin even though the amount of hemoglobin is good hemoglobin is not low hemoglobin may be good but still they are producing defective hemoglobin right or they are producing low hemoglobin because this is like easily breakable this is very damaged hemoglobin so that this this leads to hemolysis this is leads to a breakable a, you know very fragile hemoglobin so this leads to hemolysis so therefore these are the causes of hemolytic anemia is this understood by everybody yes. you guys need break yes yes, yes. Just get freshen up and um, ten minutes is okay. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Okay. So I'll pause the meeting and we'll come back after ten minutes. Doctor Fatma, is it possible possible that you yes. can send the uh, cloud recording to us because we are having some Facebook issues in Pakistan. Okay. Okay. Then I'll delete this one. I'll try to uh, um. i'm not sure if i can send in cloud because i actually started recording in the computer mm, okay i try to send you through email okay okay oh, who all are there from pakistan dr sartaj you have any issue because uh, after the class i upload it in the cloud either but cloud you know i don't have much space so after two days i have to delete we have a facebook group a private group i usually upload videos there and it will be available till your exams so if you if anybody has issue just tell me okay so we'll start with the classes okay so we were going to start with the hemolytic anemia right so i told you what are the different kind of hemolytic anemia so hemolytic anemia is either they can be inherited or they can be acquired mostly inherited are these these are usually inherited okay now for all hemolytic anemia so you have all these hemolytic anemia right thalassemia sickle cell anemia g6pd hereditary spherocytosis all the uh, hemolytic anemias they'll have similar diagnostic features you can easily diagnose them they have common diagnostic features we'll see how we'll diagnose the diagnostic clues to hemolysis are anemia with a normal white cell and platelet count right because there is only hemolysis of rbc other all cells are like completely intact other all pathways are intact so there will be only anemia the spleen or liver may be moderately enlarged due to extra medullary hemopoiesis that is due to excessive hemopoiesis that is one thing is that the uh, spleen becomes hyperactive right that is why there will be splenomegaly the second thing is that when there is excessive hemolysis going on and the bone marrow itself is not able to compensate by producing excessive amount of rbc so it leads to production of it again stimulates extra medullary hemopoiesis that is it stimulates the spleen to produce more and more rbc because the spleen and liver used to produce rbc remember in our intrauterine life so due to extra medullary hemopoiesis now that is because the bone marrow is not able to compensate for it the spleen becomes enlarged it becomes hyperactive and tries to produce more and more rbc okay so that leads to splenomegaly or hepatosplenomegaly in all remember this 
in all hepato in all hemolytic disease there will be hepatosplenomegaly only in one condition there will be only splenomegaly where which is that hereditary spherocytosis so in all hemolytic disease there will be both hepatosplenomegaly hs hepatosplenomegaly but in case of hereditary spherocytosis here there will be only splenomegaly and this is a very very important finding in recalls they will give you a child has come to you with anemia jaundice splenomegaly so when you see splenomegaly isolated splenomegaly with anemia jaundice you have to think about hereditary spherocytosis when you have hepatosplenomegaly then you have to think about other causes of hemolytic anemia okay one more thing is that all the blood disorders almost all the blood disorders okay all kind of anemia thalassemia sickle cell anemia all these blood disorders they are mainly autosomal recessive disorder except for one one kind of hemolytic disorder that is again same hereditary spherocytosis it is autosomal dominant disorder so hereditary spherocytosis is an exception when you come to uh, inheritance it is a autosomal dominant other all are recessive and it has only splenomegaly other all has hepatosplenomegaly so since it is autosomal dominant that means there will be a clear family history right because for autosomal dominant only if one of the parents are affected that means the child is supposed to have the disease so there will be a strong family history in case of hereditary spherocytosis okay so that is what they are saying then there will be raised reticulocyte count i told you how there will be raised reticulocyte count because the bone marrow is going to produce excessive amount of rbc and will lead to production of immature rbc unconjugated bilirubinemia and increased urinary bilirubin urobilinogen how unconjugated bilirubinemia tell me a broken down of hemoglobin yeah due to excessive breakdown of rbc that breaks down again leads to formation of hemoglobin this hemoglobin will be converted into bilirubin so okay. excessive rbc is broken down therefore more and more bilirubin will be formed that will lead to unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia and some amount increase urinary urobilinogen some will be completely some will be conjugated and they will be excreted via urine abnormal appearance of the red blood cell on the blood on the blood film spherocyte sickle shaped or hypochromic that is the blood cell will be spherical shape in which hemolytic disease or this is uh, spherocytosis yes spherocytes then what about sickle shaped in case of sickle cell anemia okay then we have positive direct anti globulin test only if immune cause it is test to identify antibody coated red blood cell only in case of immune immunological disorders we'll find the direct anti globulin test is positive increase red blood cell precursor in the bone marrow see so even though there is hemolytic anemia there is hemolysis is going on so more and more rbc is breaking down so there is less amount of rbc in the blood but when you look in the bone marrow there will be increased amount of rbc precursor cell why why is that there is a because there is message from the red blood cell to increase exactly exactly because there is message they are trying to compensate for the hemolysis they are trying to make more and more rbc so there will be increased rbc precursor cells in the bone marrow okay so these are the few things this uh, diagnostic features are same for all the hemolytic diseases okay So like for example you will find this all this uh, features like anemia there will be hyperbilirubinemia there is hepatosplenomegaly along with spherocytes and etc apart from that there will be increased reticulocyte okay apart from that for each of the hemolytic disease there will be certain characteristic features okay those i'll tell you as we go now let us study the hemoglobin structure see you i think you guys already know it so this is a molecule of hemoglobin it has two alpha and two beta chains these are two beta chains and these are two alpha chains and this hemoglobin has see there are four molecules 
of iron and it holds four molecules of oxygen this is this entire picture is structure of hemoglobin so hemoglobin a molecule means they mean him adult hemoglobin which is a normal hemoglobin for us as well as for after the baby is born there are there is four heme groups and globin chain in the globin chain there is two alpha and two beta globin chain okay the hemoglobin is made up of two alpha chain and two beta chain now this is important to remember because we are going to study sickle cell anemia and thalassemia now let us study sickle cell anemia what is sickle cell anemia it is common in africans middle easterns and central asians so for hematology it is very very important to remember the race in different countries in different race different kind of hematological disorders are common for sickle cell disease remember uh, sickle cell anemia okay it is present in africans mostly in africans it can be also present in central asians but remember africans it's common they'll tell you a child has a Afri south african child has come to you with anemia jaundice if nothing is given go for africa go for uh, sickle cell anemia because it is africans okay presence after 5 to 6 months of life i will tell you why so it is a autosomal recessive disorder as i told you all the hemolytic anemia they are autosomal recessive ex except for hereditary spherocytosis so it is a autosomal recessive disorder there is point mutation in number 6 beta globin chain where there is replacement of glutamic acid is replaced by valine so this is amino acid glutamic acid this will be replaced by valine we know so many amino acid together makes up a protein right and this proteins why what is the function of this proteins this protein actually has certain functions in our body every function in our body is actually how it actually becomes a function is by the means of a protein it produces protein okay so this protein will have certain function so this protein is supposed to have here 1 2 3 4 Five six on the sixth amino sixth number six it is supposed to be glutamic acid but it is instead of glutamic acid due to some defect now it is valine so that leads to formation of a defective protein this defective protein is actually was going to encode for a proper the shape of the RBC. so everything the shape the function the color of rbc RB, everything will be encoded in protein right so what happens is that due to this defect now the, it has become defective instead of being the normal biconcave shape now the rbc becomes sickle shaped when it becomes sickle shaped it will break easily when it passes through the blood vessel and when it is breaking it is called hemolytic anemia right so this is about sickle cell anemia now sickle cell anemia has a variety of features not only that it presents with anemia as well as uh, you know anemia jaundice but it presents with a lot of other features okay we are going to study about this so this particular table i have taken from um, the illustrated textbook and it is very 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 good it's very good it's not this well written in any other book so i have decided to take this okay first one is it causes anemia so we are studying about the clinical features of sickle cell disease anemia they have moderate anemia usually between 60 to 100 g per liter the hemoglobin with clinically detectable jaundice from chronic hemolysis so there is anemia as well as there is jaundice then there is infection all have marked increased susceptibility to infection from encapsulated organism such as pneumococci and haemophilus influenza there is also increased incidence of osteomyelitis caused by salmonella and other organism the susceptibility to infection is due to hypospleenism secondary to to chronic sickling and micro infraction in the spleen so when there is excessive amount of rbc is breaking down so this rbc are supposed to be i told you after 120 days when the rbc goes to the spleen and they die right the rbc are broken down they are stored like they are like this is like their uh, graveyard of rbc this is also called the graveyard of rbc the spleen 
so now excessive amount of rbc is broken down excessive amount of rbc is coming to the spleen so this will lead to micro infraction you know this will lead to completely block the spleen and that will lead to decrease in the function of the spleen the spleen will become hypo functioning yeah it is trying to be active by producing doing extramedullary hemopoiesis and stuff but it's not able to function properly so one of the other mechanism of spleen is to give us protection against organisms okay especially the encapsulated organism so when excessive rbc is coming and being dumped in the spleen the spleen becomes really you know it becomes really it itself becomes sick and it is now not able to uh, protect us certain against certain organism so that leads to certain organism in specifically encapsulated organism this is the question this is the recall question encapsulated organism pneumococcus or streptococcus pneumoniae and haemophilus influenza so these children will sickle cell anemia they are highly susceptible to this encapsulated organism infection okay also this osteo salmonella is the organism normally we know salmonella it causes what what is the disease caused by salmonella typhoiditis in <laughs> what is the normal disease that is caused by salmonella enteric fever typhoid ha ah, typhoid or enteric fever but this salmonella in particular when salmonella infects a sickle cell disease in particular in a sickle cell patient or thalassemic patient it causes osteomyelitis so salmonella usually it produces enteric fever it causes enteric fever but in a child with hemolytic disease it causes osteomyelitis so these children more apart from anemia and jaundice they are highly susceptible to infection bacterial infection encapsulated bacteria i think this is one of the questions in our clinical case also uh, there is a question they ask that uh, which of the following they are more susceptible to they are susceptible to bacterial infection next one is painful crisis so this children with sickle cell anemia they will also have painful crisis what are this crisis vaso occlusive crisis causing pain effect many organisms of the body with varying frequency and severity a common mode of presentation in late infancy is hand foot syndrome in which there is dactylitis and swelling and pain of the fingers and feet from vaso occlusion so due to excessive occlusion the rbc is broken down so excessive bro broken down of rbc there will be occlusion of the blood vessel everywhere due to excessive rbc that will lead to dactylitis vaso occlusive crisis commonly present with dactylitis means painful fingers painful fingers painful hand the bones of the limbs and spine are most common site the most serious type of painful crisis is acute chest syndrome which leads to severe hypoxia and need for mechanical ventilation and emergency transfusion avascular necrosis of the femoral head may also occur acute vaso occlusive crisis may be precipitated by exposure to cold dehydration excessive exercise stress hypoxia or infection so from this particular box this small box itself you can find like two to three recalls one is a child with sickle cell anemia has come to you or a child has come to you with anemia jaundice with dactylitis anemia jaundice dactylitis most commonly it is sickle cell anemia another thing child with sickle cell disease has come to you with chest pain okay chest pain there is tachypnea what what is the diagnosis what will you do so children with chest sickle cell syndrome anemia. hello chest syndrome yeah acute chest syndrome yeah so the children with sickle cell anemia they readily they uh, you know suffer from acute chest syndrome so in this the child will co come with severe chest pain and he will not be he'll have shortness of breath he will not be able to breathe properly so they'll ask you what is the treatment that you will give so the child has come to you with severe chest pain first of all you will relieve the pain then you'll give oxygen since the pain is due to are due to hemolysis now he does not have a, a proper hemoglobin in his body to carry the oxygen then we'll go for transfusion and since he is not able to breathe properly so we'll give him mechanical ventilation we'll study about the acute, acute chest syndrome okay 
now they'll ask you what are the precipitating factors a child has come to you with anemia jaundice or simply they will tell you a child has come to you with a, uh, a child known case of sickle cell disease has come to you with um, acute chest syndrome what are the precipitating factors precipitating factors are cold dehydration excessive exercise or stress hypoxia or infection and they can also come with acute anemia or aplastic crisis normally they are supposed to have anemia all the time but there will be aplastic crisis that is hemoglobin may fall precipitously due to parvovirus infection causes completely no temporary cessation of red blood cell production so if it is severe <coughs> anemia you see the hemoglobin level will be like will be like 60 to 100 but this children with sickle cell anemia they can also have aplastic crisis where they will have very very low it will be 10 5 level of hemoglobin will be very low it will not be even moderate level okay that is called aplastic crisis now let's look at some other features of sickle cell anemia priapism what is priapism painful erection of the penis yeah painful erection of the penis is known as priapism this is common in case of children with sickle cell needs to be treated promptly with exchange transfusion as may lead to fibrosis of the corpora cavernosa and subsequent erectile dysfunction so children with sickle cell anemia they can also suffer from priapism so we need to do exchange transfusion immediately as possible splenomegaly this is common in young children but becomes much less frequent in older children what are the long term problems long term problems are short stature delayed puberty because see they don't have proper why they be short stature because they they rbc is sickle shaped right so the rbc is continuously breaking down they are not getting proper oxygen in the blood oxygen is basically the nutrient in the blood okay so if they are not getting proper nutrient they'll be having short stature they'll have delayed puberty and moreover there will be increased susceptibility to stroke and cognitive problems this is important there will be heart failure renal dysfunction pigment gallstone etc okay so gallstone don't remember don't study this gallstone and all study this short stature delayed puberty stroke and cognitive problems why i am telling not to study gallstone is because in some other question other condition will find gallstone and you will be confused and that is commonly asked not this one okay so these are the features of sickle cell anemia this table is so so important i cannot emphasize enough so it leads to anemia increase jaundice increase susceptibility to infection encapsulated organism salmonella causes osteomyelitis there will be acute chest syndrome dactylitis there will be acute aplastic crisis then there is priapism splenomegaly there is also short stature there is stroke delayed puberty etc okay now sickle cell crisis is exacerbated by low oxygen that is hypoxia cold dehydration infection the same thing how will you treat you will treat according to the symptoms if the patient is presenting to you with infection sickle cell patient you will immunize the child you always have to immunize the child which vaccine will give this child is more susceptible to this one pneumococcal vaccine and hemophilus influenza what is the vaccine we studied dpt pentavalent vaccine diphtheria pertussis tetanus hemophilus influenza yeah and hepatitis b right diphtheria this is the pentavalent plus pcv pneumococcal vaccine so this children should always be immunized and lifelong penicillin we have to give them plus we have to give them folic acid why we are giving folic acid here why are we giving folic acid tell me it's very easy i told folic acid deficiency no see yes thing is that not folic acid deficiency this children will not have folic acid deficiency since there is excessive lysis of the rbc so the bone marrow will produce more and more rbc so if folic acid is normally present in the blood it's okay for the normal level but if bone marrow is producing excessive amount of rbc it will need more folic acid right because it is producing in excess of amount more than what is needed so it will need more and more folic acid if we don't give folic acid again that will lead to megaloblastic anemia okay 
that is why because bone marrow is continuously trying to produce rbc so that the materials are not less materials all the raw materials should be present that's why we giving a folic acid next one in acute crisis that is a child has come to you with dactylitis or has come to you with sickle cell uh, chest, acute chest syndrome in that case you will give an iv analgesic you'll give oxygen iv or oral antibiotic because usually it is susceptible they are very susceptible to infection so you'll give a antibiotic as well in acute chest syndrome oxygen analgesic and you'll go for exchange transfusion avoid triggering factors plus you'll give hydroxycarbamide sorry i wrote the spelling wrong it is a medication it is a drug now used in case of sickle cell anemia and then bone marrow transplantation that is the last treatment okay so this was all about sickle cell anemia any doubts in this no it's clear okay this is rectalitis see inflammation see this is a bit thick this area is a bit thick it's fat fingers inflammation and there will be pain okay now there are three mains now this one this part is less important okay i repeat less important so if you do not understand please do not be worried about this now there are three forms of sickle cell disease right we just studied sickle cell anemia one is sickle cell anemia this one we studied so sickle cell anemia it is autosomal recessive disorder in sickle cell anemia both the parents has to be need to have autosomal recessive means it is recessive so even your father as well as the mother needs to have the disease then only the baby will have disease okay patients are homozygous that means both the parents have for hbs virtually all their hemoglobin is sickle cell hemoglobin they have small amount of fetal hemoglobin and no adult hemoglobin because they have sickle mutation in both the globin chain so in case of sickle cell anemia we saw the hemoglobin have two alpha and two globin chain so in the globin chain when what happens there are two globin chain right two alpha two beta globin chain i just showed that picture see two alpha chain two beta chain so what happens is that in even if in one of the beta chain this uh, glutamic acid is being replaced by valine well that will lead to sickle cell disease so in sickle cell anemia when a person will get sickle cell anemia if both this beta globin chain both the beta globin chain in both the beta globin chain the glutamic acid is be being replaced by valine well that is what they are saying there is sickle mutation in both the beta globin chains okay next one is hbsc disease okay what is hbsc disease here affected children inherit the hemoglobin sickle cell hemoglobin from one parent and hbc from another parent is form result of different point mutation in the beta globin so they also have no adult hemoglobin because they have no normal beta globin gene so what what is the point here point here is that here there is no mu one mutation is yes correct glutamic acid is being replaced another mutation is some different kind of mutation and they are usually they will not be having such severe symptoms they usually have retinopathy this children with hbsc disease they have anemia which is very mild plus they have retinopathy and osteoporosis this is written somewhere else i'll just um, i think i didn't find in the book properly in some other book i think i got it so just remember hbsc they inherit this gene this defective gene from only one parent and then they will present with very mild anemia they will not present with all the features of sickle cell anemia plus they will present with retinopathy and osteoporosis then this is not important beta sickle cell this is not important okay now we are done with sickle cell disease any doubts here in this one no ma'am okay no. now let's come to hereditary spherocytosis so what is hereditary it is again i told you all the hemolytic anemia are autosomal recessive except for hereditary spherocytosis which is autosomal dominant dominant so this is autosomal dominant it is common in caucasians caucasians mean europe white population yeah white population okay. 
in case of white people mainly europeans uk etc okay now important protein in the cell membrane stabilization is known as pectin there is a protein oh, just a minute okay there is a protein in the cell membrane known as pectin okay i don't know what's wrong with my okay there is a protein known as pectin this protein will be absent in case of hereditary spherocytosis and this particular protein i told you i think it's been twice i told you now this pectin protein this suppose the green thing is pectin protein is responsible for stabilizing the membrane and it is supposed to make it biconcave shape since the protein is absent now the rbc becomes spherical shape and when it passes through this membrane it will lead to breakage of the rbc so this is known as hereditary spherocytosis it is a membrane defect okay remember it's a membrane defect what are the clinical features they will usually present with anemia in the first few days of life this is very important okay i'll i'll say how the scenario will present there will be jaundice because there is hemolysis mild to moderate splenomegaly i told you only one condition there will be splenomegaly other all condition there will be hepatosplenomegaly there is aplastic crisis gallstone formation diagnostic same for all hemolytic anemia what did i say about all hemolytic anemia how are they diagnosed tell me there will be increase in reticulocyte there will be low hemoglobin there will be increase in the unconjugated bilirubin yes ma'am also high aldh i think yes so all this yes lactate dehydrogenase is also high so all this will be same for all the disease hereditary spherocytosis what is the treatment you'll give oral folic acid why folic acid same because hemolysis is going on you will vaccinate the child because splenomegaly spleen will become hypo functioning spleen is trying to activate itself but spleen is not able to function properly so you'll vaccinate the child to prevent from all the encapsulated organism at the same time you will do splenectomy after 7 years of age because the spleen is becoming too much you know the spleen may lead, may lead to rupture of the spleen the spleen is becoming too much overloaded so you'll do a splenectomy but only after 7 years of age there is a case also clinical case book lifelong oral penicillin prophylaxis bone marrow transplantation cholecystectomy for gallstone okay so how this case will usually present they tell you a child has come to you with jaundice anemia or anemia there was a history there is no relevant history but there is a history of neonatal jaundice and he has splenomegaly and on on uh, family history her father had cholecystectomy for gallstone so you can see there is a history they'll say you has come to you with anemia other all examination is normal only has splenomegaly there was a few there was a history of neonatal jaundice for which he needed phototherapy and his father had gallstone so father had gallstone means father it is autosomal dominant disorder so father also had hereditary spherocytosis that's why he had gallstone so maybe the child is very young it did not develop gallstone yet so there will usually there is a history like that there is a recall also will tell you father is has is having gallstone child has come to you with anemia jaundice and splenomegaly okay so you have to remember because all hemolytic condition will have similar features certain things you have to remember okay is this clear yes okay. let us move g6 pd deficiency so what is the function of g6 pd now g6 pd i told you all the diseases are autosomal recessive except for hereditary spherocytosis now another new thing we have so many exception g6 pd is a x linked recessive disorder so it is a good thing that you will see only male patient that means in our question if there is a male patient okay then you can consider g6 pd if they have given you all the features if you got a female baby and in the in the options in the female baby they are saying female baby has come to you with anemia jaundice in the option there is g6 pd if you see female first thing you have to do is rule out g6 pd why because it, it occurs only in 
Yeah, it, it is a X-link recessive disease. In which, the yes. So females are usually carriers. Females do not manifest the symptoms. Male are, male are usually the sufferers. So if you see a female, you will just exclude that. It cannot be G6PD. It can be others. Okay. Now what, what is the function? What is the pathophysiology here? This G6PD deficiency means there will be the G6PD enzyme. What happens? It protects the RBC from oxidative damage. When there is G6PD deficiency, there will be oxidative damage to the RBC. That will lead to hemolysis, lysis of the RBC and lead to anemia. So usually the patient with G6PD, they are asymptomatic, but they may present with symptoms after an acute infection or drug intake. What symptoms? Usually they will have a neonatal jaundice history, same like hereditary spherocytosis, or maybe there is no history. Plus there will be acute hemolytic features, okay? They'll come with fever, malaise, abdominal pain, jaundice, and there is passage of dark urine. This is important. So how they will present is that a child has come to you uh, with anemia, jaundice, dark urine. He has no previous history. And recently he was treated for UTI. Or recently he had an upper respiratory tract infection. So I will tell you how this disease is related to that. So how will you diagnose same as other hemolytic disease? Plus you will measure the level of G6PD during infection and after infection. So normally during infection, what will happen? The G6PD will increase. After infection, it will be decreased. Okay. So you will measure if you're suspecting it is a case of G6PD along with all the other hemolytic disease, anemia uh, investigations, you have to do G6PD assay. Treatment, you will avoid the triggering factors and bone marrow transplantation. So G6PD patients are usually asymptomatic unless they have, they have taken any drug or they have uh, any acute infection, then they will show features of acute hemolysis, abdominal pain, passage of urine, dark urine, then there is fever, malaise, jaundice, okay? Now we'll study what are the triggering factors, drugs that should be avoided in G6PD. One is sulfonamide antibiotic, cotrimoxazole, this is given in which one? Throw trimoxazole. It is given in some. Thank you from that. Sorry? Remember, trimetoprin and sulfamethoxazole. Yes, yes. It is where is it given? Co trimoxazole. Genital renal disease. Sorry? Congenital renal disease. Congenital renal disease. Okay. It is also given in some upper respiratory tract yeah. infections. Okay. It's very commonly used in some of the upper respiratory tract infections. Dapsin. Dapsin is used in leprosy. Then other antibiotics such as nitrofurantoin used in UTI. Antimalarial, primaquine, chloroquine, analgesic aspirin. Okay. So, and in addition to this drug, patient with G6PD should avoid exposure to naphthalene or mothballs and ingestion of broad beans or feva beans. They, they do not induce hemolysis. Okay, other types of beans do not induce hemolysis in G6PD. So, feva beans or broad beans are contraindicated apart from the drugs also. Okay, so they will tell you a child has come to you with these features with anemia, with jaundice, malaise, abdominal pain, dark urine. He was treated, there is no relevant history, but he was treated for upper respiratory tract infection or he was treated for uh, UTI or he, he had a recent travel history to Africa or any country which is like, uh, which have uh, more prevalence of uh, malaria. That means if he has been to Africa, malaria, he, he might have taken this drugs, chloroquine, prophylaxis drug. If he, were, if he had UTI, he might have taken nitrofurantoin. If he had leprosy or upper respiratory tract, he might have taken cotrimoxazole. Or if he had a history of bone pain, he might have taken commonly aspirin. Right? So you have to relate to that. A child has come to you with this history and they will tell you there was a history of upper respiratory tract infection, there was a history of these days, this. Or the child has taken feva beans recently. So you have to think about G6PD. What about hereditary spherocytosis? What will you remember? 
at a small dominant on this plenomegaly and uh, there will be a family history mm, there will be history of neonatal jaundice plenomegaly jaundice yes and cholecystectomy mm. for sickle cell uh, for g6 uh, pd you will remember any drug history is there or not normally the child is well but he'll have drug history okay Next is uh, okay. Now we'll study thalassemia. So it is again autosomal recessive disorder due to defect in either the alpha or the beta chain of hemoglobin. When there is defect in the beta chain, it is known as beta thalassemia. When there is defect in the alpha chain of hemoglobin, it causes alpha thalassemia. Right. Now we'll study about alpha thalassemia. Alpha thalassemia. This this portion is so important. They ask. in so many recalls they will give you this question okay so if alpha c for the alpha thalassemia what happens there are two genes right there are usually four chains two alpha two beta so what happens is that there are actually four b globin gene responsible for this hemoglobin now when only one or two of the genes are deleted okay that will lead to alpha thalassemia trait that we, that is that will lead to alpha all the alpha chains only small minor change in the alpha chain and it will lead to asymptomatic alpha thalassemia when three genes are deleted that will lead to hemoglobin h disease when four genes are deleted it will lead to hemoglobin bars or hydroxyphetalis this is a very very favorite task question they always prefer to ask so remember this there are certain genes responsible for alpha thalassemia when one or two genes are absent they causes alpha thalassemia trait when three genes are absent it causes hemoglobin h when all four genes are absent it leads to hydroxyphetalis so what they will tell you hydroxyphetalis babies that is babies with alpha thalassemia that have hydroxyphetalis they usually die in intrauterine life okay they do not survive is this clear yes ma'am yes okay. now we'll study about beta thalassemia so beta thalassemia major there are two types of beta thalassemia beta thalassemia major and beta thalassemia minor in major means there will be see what is the normal uh, amount of uh, hemoglobin normal what hemoglobin is present in adult life hemoglobin hemoglobin a a a maximum about 97% hemoglobin a normal yeah and small amount of hemoglobin a2 and another very small amount of hemoglobin f very very small okay so we are supposed to have hemoglobin a about 97% but this patients with alpha thalassemia they will not have any hemoglobin a they will have so much amount of hemoglobin f so that's why they are saying if it is major alpha thalassemia sorry beta thalassemia major there will be no production of hemoglobin a there will be increased hemoglobin f so they will present with severe anemia jaundice hepatosplenomegaly there is bony deformity maxillary overgrowth i'll show you the picture of a child with thalassemia okay and if it is minor beta thalassemia minor in this case they have fetal hemoglobin is increased but they have some amount of hemoglobin a adult hemoglobin is present in some amount but major beta thalassemia major here there is no alpha alpha hemoglobin sorry no adult hemoglobin at all they have more amount of fetal hemoglobin but this fetal hemoglobin you know having we we are, we are supposed to have only in fetal life you not supposed to have it now right it's not fully functional for our body okay now let us see what are the features of a baby with beta beta thalassemia see here they'll present with pallor that means anemia jaundice bulging of the skull and maxillary overgrowth you can see here maxillary overgrowth splenomegaly hepatomegaly need for repeated blood transfusion usually thalassemic patient require monthly blood transfusion okay 
so if they require monthly blood transfusion apart from these just can you tell me what is one common um, complication of uh, repeated blood transfusion iron overload mm, very good okay so what will you do what, what is another okay iron overload chelation. what will you give sorry chelation yes you will give an iron chelating agent and what is another common thing it's a very minor uh, thing that occurs due to iron oral iron supplementation also not only transfusion constipation constipation is a common side effect of oral iron supplementation okay so this is now here they have mentioned about the complications of blood transfusion in children this is very very important okay this is very important first one is there will be iron deposition in the heart it leads to cardiomyopathy cirrhosis diabetes impaired growth there may be antibody formation allo antibodies to transfuse red blood cells in the making finding compatible blood very difficult it may lead to infection and readily it can lead to transfusion of transfer of hepatitis a b c hiv malaria then other disease jacobs disease etc and it mainly also causes it causes heart failure in the heart it causes cardiomyopathy as well as heart failure due to volume overload excessive amount of transfusion see here there is maxillary overgrowth see frontal bursting and what is this x ray appearance of thalassemia what is this called hair on end appearance yeah hair on end appearance see the bones they look like hairs So this is called hair on end end appearance in case of thalassemia. I'll tell you a child has come to you and uh, came with anemia, jaundice, and on X-ray of the skull there is hair on end appearance. So you have to think of this hair on end appearance is thalassemia. Okay. Okay. Management of beta thalassemia. How will you manage? You have to do monthly blood transfusion if possible, bone marrow transplantation. What is one complication? All the complications are written here. This was not written, so I gave iron overload. So we have to give iron chelating agent. Okay. Okay. Now we have studied all the causes of microcytic anemia. We have studied iron deficiency anemia, anemia of chronic disease means due to renal failure mostly. They then beta thalassemia major, beta thalassemia, alpha thalassemia trait. important thing is iron deficiency and thalassemia this to the last now let us see what is the difference i told you we'll do a iron profile remember i told you in case of sickle yes, cell anemia okay in case of sickle cell anemia i told you that iron deficiency anemia i told you we have to do iron profile so when we do iron profile and we'll see the iron other changes also because in other diseases like thalassemia also there will be changes in iron so we'll do iron profile so see hemoglobin in case of iron deficiency it will be low less than 100 in thalassemia it will be very low less than 60 now mcv mch it will be reduced here in thalassemia also very low ferritin since it is iron deficiency anemia that means they don't have storage form of iron so iron will be reduced but thalassemia has nothing to do with iron thalassemia is associated with problem in the beta globin chain so here the iron will be normal what is tibc total iron binding iron binding capacity okay suppose why tibc is increased because there is uh... less iron in the blood mm. so mm. and more transporter will be present for less iron yes see suppose this is a protein this protein is supposed to bind with the iron suppose this is iron this v shaped this i this is okay I'll, i'll make some flower or something okay this is a flower this is iron so this protein is known as the suppose a transferrin receptor this is a receptor protein okay it is supposed to transfer this iron but when there is less iron so what will happen this protein will is already present in the body this receptor is already present in the body so it will be vacant it is like free so the concentration will increase that is why they are saying total iron binding capacity will be increased because there is no iron 
so there is more capacity there is no more vacancy serum ferritin trans transferrin receptor here again the receptor will be increased because there is no iron iron saturation will be reduced there is redu reduction in iron in the body but in case of beta thalassemia all this will be normal so beta thalassemia and iron deficiency anemia are usually they present with very common features okay except for the jaundice so how will you differentiate using the iron profile okay and beta thalassemia the hemoglobin will be very low less than 60 whereas in case of iron deficiency it will not be that low okay understood this yes yes okay let's move on okay now we have studied everything let us just have a glance so in newborn what happens is this see this is the normal they are saying in newborn adult hemoglobin is very less there is 74 percentage of fetal hemoglobin so there is much amount of fetal hemoglobin in the newborn in adult there is increase amount of adult hemoglobin fetal hemoglobin is nearly absent or 0.3% what happen in beta thalassemia i told you in beta thalassemia adult hemoglobin is almost supposed to be is sorry this is not this is about trait trait is good trait is good hmm. see beta thalassemia so they are supposed to have adult hemoglobin but they have no adult hemoglobin they have increased hemoglobin f fetal hemoglobin and adult hemoglobin a2 even in sickle cell disease and sickle cell trait trait means it is a minor form of a disease and it does not have any clinical features mostly the children are asymptomatic sickle cell disease also there is increased fetal hemoglobin can you see so thalassemia sickle cell disease you can see there is increase fetal hemoglobin It is not supposed to be after birth. The fetal hemoglobin is supposed to reduce, but then still it, he is having more hemoglobin, more fetal hemoglobin. Actually, this is this has a benefit. Not Doctor Sataj. Can anybody else tell me what is the benefit? Fetal hemoglobin has a, a high affinity to carry oxygen. Mm. then what is the benefit here how is it going to benefit here because there is uh, if uh, anemia uh, there is oxygen saturation may be low very good so normally hemoglobin we know that fetal hemoglobin has high affinity towards oxygen very good now in adult condition that is after birth this fetal hemoglobin is not supposed to be there so this children have sickle cell anemia or they have thalassemia they have sickle shape and they are having rbc breakdown rbc breakdown means they have no hemoglobin no rbc so they have decreased oxygen saturation why because hemoglobin is responsible for carrying the oxygen to every tissue right now since there is the their rbc itself is defective they have no oxygen they have very reduced oxygen but this children also it's a compensatory mechanism or whatever it is by the mercy of allah what happens is that these children have fetal hemoglobin now this fetal hemoglobin they have so they have increased affinity towards oxygen so even though one side the lysis is going on because of the sickle shape because of the defect in the globin chain there is decrease hemoglobin decrease oxygen but at least some fetal hemoglobin is there so this fetal hemoglobin will try to give service will try to carry the oxygen will try to carry the oxygen and supply to the to the tissues is this understood yes so fatima please repeat okay okay so what happens is that normally fetal hemoglobin is not supposed to be there in our body right after birth right yes. but these children with sickle cell anemia they have fetal hemoglobin see sickle cell anemia they have increased amount of fetal hemoglobin beta thalassemia they have increased amount of fetal hemoglobin now this having this fetal hemoglobin act as a protective mechanism how because if they are sickle shape see they are sickle shape uh, they have sickle shape rbc they are sickle cell anemia sickle shape rbc means this rbc is breaking down continuously rbc is not able to pass when it is not able to pass what is the function of rbc rbc carries oxygen 
hemoglobin right hemoglobin carries oxygen so when this hemoglobin rbc is broken down there will be reduced oxygen supply to the tissue right yes now this fetal hemoglobin is present it's like you know it's like a way allah has compensated them it's like that like they have this children with sickle cell anemia on one side they have lysis going on on the other side they have fetal hemoglobin this fetal hemoglobin has increased affinity towards oxygen i told you so this will bind at least now some fetal hemoglobin they have increased amount they have like 74% and very much increased they don't have any adult hemoglobin so in fact this fetal hemoglobin is better for them because fetal hemoglobin has high affinity for oxygen so it will carry oxygen and it will transport it to the tissue and at least it will give some services it will compensate for the hemolysis is this clear now yes if you don't okay. understand i'll speak in bangla and explain you you want that no no no, no, no. Okay. i understand okay so what happens is that fetal hemoglobin so children who have sickle cell anemia and thalassemia usually up to the age of 5 months or 6 months they will not show any symptoms you know why because if they have sickle cell anemia up to 5 6 months they will have fetal hemoglobin so the fetal hemoglobin is giving proper service it is transporting the oxygen after 5 or 6 months this children will reduce there will be reduction in the fetal hemoglobin and then they will develop symptoms so that's why in cases of fetal uh, sickle cell anemia thalassemia all children they will come after 1 year of age or at least 5 to 6 months of age understood yes okay. anybody who didn't understand this no dr ahlam you understood yes okay okay we are done with anemia we have almost come to the end now let us see about anemia how to diagnose anemia simple approach to diagnose anemia first one when there is anemia you have to look at the reticulocyte count okay see this table if you feel confusing don't read it i always find it confusing so just for our understanding i read it but it's not necessary to give in the uh, for exam because in exam you will find small small clues it's very easy to diagnose okay anemia so you'll see the reticulocyte count if reticulocyte count is high or normal then you have to look at the bilirubin if bilirubin is also high reticulocyte is high that means some hemolysis is going on then you have to think about hereditary sclerocytosis sickle cell anemia thalassemia you will do the blood film in the blood film what you will see spherocytes you will see sickle shaped cell and hplc this is a test high power liquid chromatography okay and then you saw high reticulocyte but you are getting the bilirubin is normal then you have to think of okay maybe there is some blood loss or there is some erythropoietin qualitative abnormal erythropoiesis or maybe there is some iron deficiency that's why the body is trying to compensate by increasing the amount of uh, rbc and they end up making the reticulocyte but there is no hemolysis you will again see the blood film but if the reticulocyte count is low very low that means what it's not even normal it's very low reticulocyte normal count is 0.2 or 0.2 to 2 up to 2% is normal so if reticulocyte count is very low which is low below the normal level then that means there is red cell aplasia there is reduced red cell production itself that is why even the reticulocyte which is supposed to be at least 2% that is also very low so that means rbc is not being produced properly that is why there is no reticulocyte which is what are the causes of red cell aplasia diamond black fen syndrome then we have parvovirus b19 transient erythroblastopenia of the childhood so what we will do parvovirus b19 serology will do to check for parvovirus b19 for diamond black fen syndrome you will do a bone marrow aspiration and you will look for other congenital anomaly because diamond black fen is associated with other congenital anomaly and you will look for a family history because it is a autosomal dominant disorder okay other things you have to know blood film will show spherocytosis in case of hereditary spherocytosis 
sickle cells and target cell in sickle cell disease, hypochromic microcytic cell in thalassemia and iron deficiency. In HPLC, that means uh, high power liquid chromato high performance liquid chromatography. In sickle cell disease, you will find HBS, no hemoglobin A is present. In beta thalassemia major, only hemoglobin F, that is fetal hemoglobin is present. In trait, only some amount of hemoglobin A is present in alpha thalassemia. Just remember the first two. No need to study the traits. Traits are not important. Okay. So if it is sickle cell anemia, there is only HBS. If it is thalassemia, fetal hemoglobin is present. Is this clear? Yes. Okay, I think we are done with uh, anemia. Okay, another one. No, no, we are not done with anemia. So this whole class is going to be with anemia. Direct antiglobulin test. So what is direct antiglobulin test? It detects the presence of antibody coating the red blood cell. It is essential for the diagnosis or exclusion of immune-mediated hemolytic anemia. So, you know, there is immune-mediated hemolytic anemia. There is some, if there is any immunological cause or autoimmune cause of hemolytic anemia to diagnose that, how it will present. So if, a, if there is any antibody is produced against our RBC. So this RBC will be coated by certain kind of antibody. This antibody is produced again RBC and it is going to break the RBC. So direct antiglobulin test, it is going to detect the presence of any such kind of antibody. And it usually is present in case of autoimmune diseases. To perform the test, red blood cells are incubated and anti-human globulin. Uh, and if antibody is present on the cell, the anti-human globulin will cause agglutination. This agglutination is recorded as a, a positive direct antiglobulin test. Example of uh, example at these. Okay. So what they do is that they take the red blood cell, okay, and they give anti-human globulin. That is, they give an antibody against the RBC, against this, hemo this uh, antibody, which might be present. If any antibody is present against RBC, so this will cause reaction and that will be agglutination. Okay. So what are the causes? Hemolytic disease of the newborn, autoimmune hemolytic anemia, drug-induced hemolytic anemia, hemolytic transfusion reaction. For our exam, the first two causes, that is the hemolytic disease of newborn and autoimmune hemolytic anemia, these two are important. This particular test, this particular diagnosis can change your, uh, test can change your entire diagnosis, okay? So remember this, direct DAT test, direct antiglobulin test is positive in hemolytic disease of the newborn and in case of autoimmune hemolytic anemia. What is hemolytic disease of the newborn? that RH incompatibility, ABO incompatibility. In all these diseases, most of the time, not every time. In ABO incompatibility, in most, in some of the time it may be negative, but in some time it may be positive. So hemolytic disease of the newborn, you can say 50-50. And autoimmune hemolytic anemia, always the DAT will be present, 100%. 100%. The direct antiglobulin test will be positive in case of autoimmune hemolytic anemia, okay? Now we'll study autoimmune hemolytic anemia. Here, antibody is produced against the individual's own RBC. So they will present with anemia during intercurrent illness and resolve spontaneously, usually associated with SLE, JIA, and Hodgkin's lymphoma. So these patients, you know, I had a friend who had autoimmune hemolytic anemia, there were no sign and symptom, but she would suffer from recurrent episodes of severe anemia. Her hemoglobin would be as low as 6 milligram, like that. So after a lot of investigation, they found out it is autoimmune hemolytic anemia. So only if there is some predisposing condition, for example, if she is having some other infection, okay, due to some other illness, if she is very weak, only then that will lead to hemolysis. And then she will suffer from anemia, hemolytic anemia. So diagnosis is confirmed by the characteristic blood film hemolysis profile, that is presence of unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia, raised LDH, raised reticulocyte, and reduced heptoglobin levels. 
and positive direct antiglobulin test. Autoimmune hemolytic anemia, direct antiglobulin test is always positive. In cases that do not resolve spontaneously, immunosuppressive treatment may be required, such as steroid as a thioprene or cyclosporine. So most cases of autoimmune hemolytic anemia, they're very mild. They only undergo hemolysis. They uh, show the symptom only during illness. Usually they will resolve spontaneously, okay? Next one is hemolytic disease of the newborn. Is everybody here? Are you guys sleeping? Oh, no. so, yeah. <laughs> Are you guys exhausted? No, no ma'am. Okay, who all are there? I think, I hope everybody's here. Okay, we are just yes, going to finish in some time. And uh, next class will be easier. And for the next class, I'll give you some homework as well. So don't worry, I told you, anemia is like the half of the chapter. Almost more than uh, half of the chapter is anemia. Just 15 minutes, don't worry. You can have a, you can have water or whatever. Okay, we'll continue. <clears throat> so hemolytic disease of the newborn, here antibodies are produced against the blood group antigen. It may be anti-A, anti-B, that is RH, ABO incompatibility then anti-DRH incompatibility, anti-CAL antibodies, okay? What is the mechanism? Let us look here. So commonly, here we are talking about the ABO incompatibility, not the RH. So ABO incompatibility as well as RH combined. What happens? This is a RH positive father and this is RH negative mother. During pregnancy, the RH negative mother is having a RH positive baby. The RH positive baby's blood will enter into the mother's bloodstream. This usually happens during the delivery. Okay. Baby's RH positive blood is entering into the mother. Invading the RH positive cells causes the production of RH antibody. So this RH positive, uh, this uh, RH po baby is positive. From the baby, mother will get some RH positive blood. Against this RH positive blood, they will produce some antibody. Why? Because the mother is RH negative. She does not need this RH positive. This RH positive is like an antibody. It's like a foreign body for her. So the body will produce an antibody against it. And the body is going to keep it saved. In the subsequent preg pregnancy, an RH antibody remains in the mother's bloodstream. In the subsequent pregnancy, in the next pregnancy, if the baby is RH negative, the baby with RH positive baby, sorry, if the baby is RH positive, the RH antibodies will attack the RH positive blood cells causing RH disease, that is hemolytic disease. So now the mother is having RH positive antibody, right? Now she has a baby. Now second time she got pregnant and the baby is again RH positive, same like before. Now, before the mother didn't have any antibody, now the mother have antibody and this antibody will come and attack the RH positive blood of the baby and lead to severe hemolysis and the baby will suffer from hemolytic disease and the baby will die. That is known as erythroblastosis fetalis. Is this clear to everybody? Yes. What will yes. happen if the baby is RH negative? This is a RH positive baby. So the RH positive antibody is coming and attacking him. What is happen? What will happen if in the pregnant pregnancy this baby is RH negative? Antibody do not attack uh, this baby. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Because these antibodies are against only RH negative, RH positive. They are not against RH negative. So they will be okay. Only if the baby is RH positive. So the anti-RH positive antibody will come and attack. Okay. Is this clear? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Okay. Now we'll just study about megalo. This is the last topic. So don't worry. Megaloblastic anemia. So that if when there is deficiency, just don't look at the entire table. Just have an eye on what I'm writing. So when there is vitamin B12, okay deficiency, folic acid deficiency. These are needed for synthesis of thymidine triphosphate. That is mainly needed for synthesis of DNA in the RBC. 
So when there is deficiency of this, this will lead to impaired DNA synthesis in the RBC, delayed cell division, hemoglobin synthesis will be normal, but it is not mature. The hemoglobin synthesis is good, RBC synthesis is good, but what happens is that it is not mature because there is no DNA synthesis. That will lead to defective nuclear maturation, so immature cell. That will lead to megaloblastic anemia, macrocytic anemia, that is formation of large RBCs, or known as giant metamyelocyte. So large RBC will be formed. So this is about megaloblastic anemia. How vitamin B12 and folic acid deficiency leads to megaloblastic anemia. Is this clear to everybody? Um, yes. yes. Now come to this next, this one I told you, I'll say later. Babies with sickle cell disease experience more problems as fetal hemoglobin is turned off. Okay, later. In adults, fetal hemoglobin production can be reactivated pharmacologically, which is useful in the treatment of disease such as sickle cell disease. The sickle cell disease, after six months of time, I told you that it will be turned off, right? Six months of time, fetal hemoglobin will be reduced. Okay. So see how this fetal hemoglobin is actually helping in reducing the hemolysis. Okay. Either you can remember uh, just by heart, it reduces polymerization or you can remember. So what happens is that when there is increase in the fetal hemoglobin, they will decrease the hemoglobin S polymerization. What is po hemoglobin S? Hemoglobin S is the sickle-shaped hemoglobin that is produced in case of sickle cell anemia. They undergo polymerization. When they undergo polymerization, there is a process that will lead to breakdown of them. Okay? But when there is increased amount of sickle fetal hemoglobin, this fetal hemoglobin will decrease the polymerization. When they're decreasing the polymerization, there will be decreased damage to the membrane, to the membrane of the cell. And therefore, there will be decreased hemolysis. Decreased hemolysis means at least some hemoglobin will be increased, so it will act as a protective mechanism. Okay? So this is a recall question they usually ask that, what is the mechanism of uh, protective mechanism of fetal hemoglobin? So how fetal hemoglobin acts as a protective mechanism in sickle cell anemia by polymerization. This is an important recall question. Okay. Is this clear? Yes. Yes, ma'am. So I'll just go through all the slides and I'll not read it. Just see. Anybody has any doubts, tell me or you can tell in the next class. Class morphological classification of anemia. So we are done with all types of anemia. Next class, we'll just have to do the cases which you people will study. I'm sure you will study, you have to study. And we will do um, reading disorders, which is very short topic and only two guidelines, that's it. Okay. Okay. Anybody has any doubt about the newcomers? Dr. Hasina, Dr. Hanna, Dr. Sartaj, and who else is here? Dr. Um, I think I yes. Oh, sorry, <laughs> um, uh, it's Hasina. Um, no, um, with regard to um, the exams, would these notes and the SOP uh, be enough or do we have to use the illustrated textbook of hematology? I think you mentioned the illustrated textbook, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, yes. See, for FOP, now it depends what you're going for. And if you're going for both the exams, I'll suggest you a different thing, okay? So what I say is that we started the course in January and we are supposed to finish by April 10th at max. Okay, I'm trying to finish it earlier. So we'll have about two months to revise before the exam. For you guys, you have to, again, you'll have one month because you missed one month of class, right? But that's not an issue. One month should be more than enough. 
so what you will do is that at first like if you are reading this for the first time for the first reading i would suggest you read the pdf open the textbook illustrated only and then you read the clinical cases in most of the topics what i do is that i take from illustrated and sop it's a huge book so only the important parts of sop i try to include in the pdf okay so almost everything is present in the illustrated so if you can if you can read it's really well and good but if you are going for the first revision you if you have to read a book go for the illustrated so open the illustrated book read the pdf and then the clinical cases clinical cases fop and tas once you are done with everything because the pdf will have some portion of sop right once you are done with everything then go for sop because i don't think so it's practically possible i have asked uh, them to read sop simultaneously i don't think so it's practically possible to read sop simultaneously with the classes so if you want you can skip it for now you can just do it later the major systems like neonatology respiratory hematology cardio neuro all these major systems you can go through sop okay but for now if you are starting for the first reading don't go for sop for the first reading at least if you really want go after two three systems after you are very much thorough with getting two three systems and i have included first parts of um, important parts of sop so just read the pdf if you can illustrate it and the clinical cases are must and during your revision time you'll have a lot of time for revision i have planned accordingly we'll do the recalls plus we'll do the sop you can go simultaneously just have one one reading that should be enough because once you're thorough with everything some added information will be okay but at once if you are trying to take a lot in the first reading itself there will be a lot for you okay and for the recalls actually we did re we started doing recalls in the first two or three classes but uh, my the students suggested that you know everybody suggested that no we'll do the recalls in the end because they are not able to correlate just after finishing one system they are not able to remember <coughs> so we decided we'll do it just before exam maybe two or three days i'll dedicate wholly to the recalls and we'll do it that way okay anybody has any other doubt dr hasina dr nisha um i don't know if you can hear me yes yes i can um i just wanted to know the full name of the illustrated book okay do you want the book illustrated textbook of pediatrics i have given all the materials in my telegram channel i'll send you the link if it's not available i'll send you the pdf okay and all the books all the materials all the books you have just have to scroll up and go back and illustrated textbook of pediatrics the name of the book is and then you have sop all the materials are given so for you guys the one who ones who joined recently i'll make a separate group you will be there in the um, means the main group also and i'll try to make a separate group or else i'll i'll have to give all the pdf to you guys individually for the missed classes okay or do you want the pdf later do you want the pdf later Like after you are almost done with half of the classes, the missed classes. Um, sorry, I'd like the PDFs as soon as you can give us. Okay, sure. Per 